Genesis chapter 12, as we dig in here, uh, we went through the first part, but we'll go over it again. It was a couple of weeks ago when we were there, uh, last week being Easter. Aren't you glad he's risen? <laughs> There's a hope here. Praise the Lord. Uh, and his word is still true. Uh, Abraham, being in a place, didn't know where he was going. The Lord just said it was time to go, and he went, uh, and he was faithful, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Uh, but it says in verse 1 of chapter 12, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, uh, unto a land that I will show thee. Uh, so get away from your stuff. Uh, cause yourself to be separated from the things that are going to hold you in bondage, the things that are going to hold you down, the, the ways of the world, the ways uh, of our own hearts that are going to let hold us down and hold us back from what God wants. Separate yourself from those things. And then I'm going to make a great nation out of you. So there's a blessing in, in separation. There's a blessing in separating yourself from your own feelings, from your own emotions. And we can't trust our own feelings or emotions. We can trust the word, but we can't trust our own thoughts sometimes. Uh, so we have to really base everything on what the word is. That's why it's so important to be in the word constantly, just letting the word minister to your heart and show you what's true and what's real. Uh, this, this world stuff is not real. <laughs> uh, th this is all going to go. Uh, but but he's, he's going to come and get us before that happens, and, and thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, he said, and I will make a great nation out of you. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Uh, not only are you going to be in a great nation, and God's blessing is going to be on you, but you are going to be a blessing, Abram. You're going to be a blessing to those around you. You're going to be a blessing to those that are there. And that's certainly for us, too, as the word comes in, as we separate ourselves from the things of the world, not, not separated so that we're hermits, but separated to that place where we're following one person and one person alone. Uh, and that's the Lord. As we follow him, we should be a blessing to those around us. Uh, maybe not a blessing enough to get them to come to heaven, but certainly a blessing to show them that there's a different way, that there's something better. And really, the world needs to see that today. Uh, the world has got such an awful opinion of what the church is, what Christianity is. Uh, they think we're haters. <laughs> uh, but the Lord is far from that. Uh, I, I don't see anything when Jesus was on the cross of him saying that he hated the world. In fact, what did he do in John chapter 17? <laughs> he prayed. What did he do on the cross? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Bringing, bringing a hope to the world that was so awful that it would crucify God and himself. Abram, I want you to be a blessing. I don't want you to be a curse like the rest of the world. I want you to be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So out of Abram's loins, we're going to come to this great nation. Uh, and remember last time we went through, there was three reasons why that was going to be true. Uh, from Isaiah, we saw that it was going to be a witness uh, of who the God was. It was going to be, uh, he was going to be the keeper of the word. He was going to pass down the word. And he was going to be a conduit. He was going to be, a, a, from his loins was going to come the redemption of the world. And so we see these three reasons that why Abram had come, why Abram was going to be there. Boy, that's a lot of responsibility, isn't it? <laughs> but, but it was so freeing for him that, that he could just walk through the world trusting the Lord in the midst of it. The responsibility was the Lord's. Abram just wanted to believe the Lord. And it says in Scripture that it was counted to Abram for righteousness because he believed. And for you and I, that's the same thing. We, we believe who God is. We believe what his word says. We trust him and we walk in the truth of that. And more and more, that's going to become more and more evident because the world is getting so dark that any kind of light is going to shine that much brighter. You guys are great light bulbs. You're going to be shining all over. You're better than halogens. You're going to last a lot longer than halogens. And when the world gets destroyed, you're still going to be shining. 
because you're going to be in the midst of Jesus, in the presence of Jesus, and he's going to be the light in heaven. And we're reflections. You're going to be shining for a long time. Hang on to the truth and just trust him in the midst of it and, and let him work those things out. Abram didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what was before him, just like you and I. We, we know where we are, but we don't always know the direction that God is going to take us. But he trusted God that whatever direction he took him was going to be good. And for whatever direction he takes us, whether it's cancer, whether it's a new job, whether it's separation from family for a season, whatever it is, we can trust the Lord that he's going to get us through those things. And that should be the encouragement for us. Lord, no matter what, I'm going to trust you. And as you come to those places, your maturity in the things of the Lord is growing by leaps and bounds. And in that, the Lord is going to bless and he's going to encourage and he's going to strengthen you for it. He always gives the grace for what you need before you enter into those things. We just don't realize what it is or how it's going to come to pass. But we know that God is going to be faithful because he's always faithful. So it says then in verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran, uh, this place that, that's called Haran that, that means parched. So they stopped uh, in Haran. And if you remember in the previous chapter, in chapter 11, uh, uh, verse 31, it says that Terah took Abram. So Terah was Abram's father. Uh, and he took Lot, uh, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and, and his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And there they came unto Haran, but they dwelt there. And they dwelt there for a long time, 25 years, wasted years almost, as we would look at it. The Lord certainly working on Abram's heart, but also in that place where he could have been a lot further, a lot sooner. And sometimes we look and go, Lord, I've wasted so many years. And maybe we have. But Paul said, I look forward. I don't look behind. I look forward. I press towards the mark of the high calling of Christ. I, I look forward to the things that God has in my life. And so the Lord takes Abram's father home. And Abram now is 75 years old. And he departs out of Haran, out of this place that's parched. And sometimes during those wasted years, what, where we spend that, that time is really a parched land. We're parched. We're thirsty for more of the things of the Lord. We're, we're thirstier for, for what God has. And we're just not satisfied with what the world has for us. It's a dry time. And sometimes that can last a long time. But don't give up hope because God is not done. And so Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son. Remember the Lord told Abram to get out. He didn't say to take everything with you. He said, get away from your country, get away from your kindred, get away from your father's house. <laughs> he ends up taking others with him that caused delay and that caused hardships to come. Because he had 25 years that was wasted in Haran. And we know Lot from... Uh, scriptures after this that there's going to be strife between them complete obedience is the best thing for us sometimes we we look and we have partial obedience but partial obedience is still disobedience isn't it <laughs> and disobedience never causes blessing never causes things to come together well uh, we, we need to be completely given over to what God has told us and what God wants to, to speak to us so he takes Lot, and he takes Sarai, his, his wife, uh, and all the souls that they had gotten in Haran. So evidently their servants, they were a rich family, evidently. They had servants, and all the souls that came with them now are going forth into the land of Canaan. Uh, and they came in then to that land of Canaan, uh, a, a place which means subdued or humbled. So they, they've gone from a place that was parched, to a place that's subdued. Abraham, even the name of Canaan means something for Abraham. He comes into a place where his own will is subdued, his own will is humbled, and he gives himself over to what the Lord has called him to. And the Lord will take us from those dry times. 
and he'll humble us down. But it, but it's not something that hurts. He's not going to do it in a hurtful way. He's going to do it in a way where we're going to be glad to do it. Lord, thank you for humbling me to realize I need salvation. And aren't you glad he did that? You went from a dry place to a place of being humbled so that you could receive all that the Lord wanted to pour out on you. The world looks at it and, and, and says, we don't want him ruling over us. We want what we want. Well, what they want is something that keeps them in bondage, not something that sets them free. The Lord always wants to set you free from the things of bondage in this world. <laughs> and so they come to this place and Abram passes through the land to the place of, of Sikkim or Shechem is what it's really going to end up being into the plain of Mora. Uh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. <laughs> uh, the Canaanite, not a good group of people, not a group that was going to be uh, encouraging for Abram, uh, but a group that, that was going to be something that the Lord was going to work in and through for Abram's life. And so it says that the Lord then appeared unto Abram and said unto him, Unto your seed will I give this land. Remember, he's already promised him that he would. And now he says, this is the land that I'm going to give to you. As he travels all this way, this is a long journey because he's come from Ur of the Chaldees. And they would probably come up and then go around and then come back down. This could be an 800 mile journey. It takes a long time by foot. <laughs> I don't know how many times you've walked 800 miles on, on your vacation, but uh, probably not too many. But here he is. He walks up and comes back down. And now he's coming down through Israel from the north, and he's going to go to the south. Uh, it's just so you can get a picture of, of where he is. Uh, but notice the Lord says, I will give you this land. This land is going to be yours, Abram. And really, people have odds with this. Well, the Canaanites were there. How can God take it away from the Canaanites and give it to Abram? Who ultimately owns everything in the world? God. He can do whatever he wants. But people have trouble with that because they went their way. <laughs> and we don't want God's way. And it wasn't that he was going to leave the Canaanites without speaking to their hearts and offering them salvation. It's just that they didn't want the things of the Lord. And whenever we don't want the things of the Lord, there's going to be death and destruction. Certainly a spiritual death, and certainly destruction is going to come. We're going to see that in just a minute here. Uh, so he comes into the land and he's going to give them that land. Just like we get heaven the same way he gives us heaven. He He doesn't... Tell us that we have to buy our way into heaven. doesn't tell us we have to work our way into heaven. He gives it as a free gift to those that are obedient, to those that uh, submit themselves to his will rather than our own will. I'm going to give you this land. And so what does Abram do? He builds an altar to the Lord. An altar is, is a, uh, just a, a, a picture of worship. He builds an altar. Lord, you brought me to this place. I'm going to worship you for what you've done. And we have those places where we build altars. As the Lord answers our prayers for whatever we've prayed, for marriage, for kids, for uh, salvation, for whatever, there, there's a place there that we build. We, we know, Lord, th this, is, this is the place that you saved me in that when I was reading your word or when I was out in the woods or w if I was in a church with somebody and, and they... They gave a salvation message, and I realized I needed salvation. We, we have those places that we remember that, God, you answered me here. When I was in this trouble, you, you, I cried out to you, and you answered, and we worship. So we're really in our heart building altars of worship to the Lord for what he's done for us. We're so thankful, Lord, that you kept us. So thankful, Lord, that you brought us in to now come and be with you. He comes into the land, the Lord gives him the land, and it says that he built an altar. It doesn't say he and Lot, it says he did. In his heart, Abraham was grateful for where the Lord had brought him. He's, he's brought him 800 miles to come into a land, and he thanks him for it. Lord, you kept me safe for 800 miles of walking through strange lands. Lord, thank you for keeping me. Look at how many years you and I have been on this earth. And who do you think kept us every day of our lives? It wasn't because you were handsome and beautiful. 
<laughs> ugly. Did you call me ugly? <laughs> I think he just called me ugly. <laughs> Michael, we got to talk after this, okay? We'll get there. <laughs> We didn't get there because of that. We got there because of his grace and his mercy and his love. Even when we were enemies of his, it says that Christ Jesus died for us. That's grace. And it's grace that's kept us all our years. And we can build an altar and just thank him. Lord, thank you for keeping me all these years. We celebrate birthdays, but really what we're doing is thanking the Lord that you kept me another year, Lord. You've kept me through another season. You've kept me through another time. And it's just so sweet. I don't know about you, but spring has come early this year. I'm thankful. <laughs> but boy, when when we start getting more aged, when there's more years behind us than there are in front of us, <laughs> we hope anyway, I don't want to live another 75 years. <laughs> I'd rather get home. But you just wonder how many more winters are we going to go through? How many more years am I going to rake leaves? How many more years am I going to shovel the driveway before I go home? And you start worshiping a little bit more, I think. Lord, I, I woke up this morning. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Okay, I'll worship you in the midst of it. We start giving thanks for more and more things, I think, as we know him, as we look at him. But here's Abram. He comes and he comes into the land and he builds an altar to the Lord that appeared unto him. He starts worshiping. Uh, Abram was a man who worshipped. Uh, and he removed from thence unto a mountain in the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. So he's coming down south. He's coming towards Judah. Um, uh, and he pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And here he is in a place. Bethel means house of God. Ai means heap of ruin. So he's building his tent in between the house of God and the heap of ruin. He's building the, this place. He's coming into this place w where he's uh, not building a house, building another altar because the Lord has kept him. And what did he say? He calls on the name of the Lord. As he calls on the name of the Lord, Lord, I, I don't want to be ruined. And I want to know you in the midst as I travel through this land, Lord. Help me to stay close to you and who you are and help me to walk with you. He worships the Lord for taking care of him. And we know that any time you get close to the Lord, <laughs> things are going to go south real quick. And that's where he goes. Verse 9 says that Abraham journeyed going still towards the south. <laughs> Trouble is he's going to go too far south. And we're going to see that now. The, the attack comes. And whenever you get with the Lord, things are going to sometimes be hard, sometimes be destructive, sometimes be... This, you might end up in despair for the way things are going. And Abram certainly could have done that. He didn't always hold on to what he was supposed to, just like you and I. But the encouragement is there is that God is going to take care of us even in the midst of making wrong decisions. He can bring right out of it. And he says there was a, a famine in the land. So here's Abram, he comes into the land, uh, and it said that the Canaanite was in the land. Remember, we looked at that. The, the enemy was in the land. So what is the Lord going to start doing but causing the enemy to despair of where they are to go somewhere else so Abraham can have the land? And he does that many times by famine. Mm. And doesn't he do that in the world still today? Look at how many countries are in famine because of the idol worship that's going on in their lands. As we look at it spiritually, we see that there's a, a famine in the land for the word of God. And we see the results of that even in our own country. We see the laws that are being passed. We see the direction that the country is going. We see, even see the direction that the church is going. And the church is going in the wrong direction. The majority of the church is going in the wrong direction. And why is that? Because they want people in the church instead of souls saved to heaven. And whenever you start doing that, there's going to be a famine of the word of God. And we see it in churches. You see smoke machines. You see a lot of great worship in a little bit of word. Or you have a pastor that says, I'm the only one that can read the word, so you don't need to carry your Bibles because I'm the only one that needs it. We need the word more than ever, each and every one of us. 
And if I ever start promoting myself to the place of telling you what you need to do, you know, Jerry, that's right, Jerry, out. <laughs> Either I'm out of here or you're out of here, but both of us have got to go, right? we got to be in that place where the word is the most important thing in our lives. That, that song is so beautiful. It's the deer pants for the water brooks. That should be us panting after the word of God. I want it so much, Lord, that I am going to drive myself to get to that place where your word is. I'm going to drive my heart. I'm going to drive my emotions. I'm going to drive my spirit to that place where your word ministers to me, where I can get refreshed. This building is not going to refresh you. His word, his spirit is going to refresh you. And that's what we need to have. There's a famine in the land. And Abram, notice the wording here. Abram went down into Egypt. Whenever you leave Israel, whenever you leave a a place of spiritual prosperity, you're going down. Abram went down to Egypt. Mm, Doesn't say across. Doesn't say he, he moved locations. He said he went down. But what you don't see is the Lord appearing to him saying, Abram, go down to Egypt. You see Abram making up his own mind. And don't we do that sometimes? Lord, I know your word. Lord, I know what you say. But, Lord, I'm going to make up my own mind. I mean, we purposely don't say that, but that's what we do, don't we? I can handle this one, Lord. I got it covered. I'm good now. (laughs) Oh, boy. Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. It doesn't say he went there to visit for a vacation. He went there to sojourn. Why? Because there was a famine. And he didn't trust God to get him through the famine. And sometimes there's going to be famine in your life, famine of good times, famine of rich times. Don't get discouraged and go somewhere you're not supposed to go. Go back to the Word of God. Go back to you know, to where you know it's right. Go back to the Word. Get refreshed by Him and strengthened up in who He is. Because the famine was grievous. He didn't think God could take care of him in the midst, so he left without asking God, without having God tell him. So it came to pass that when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, (laughs) Oh, Abram, Abram, uh, behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Uh, Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they shall kill me, but they'll save you alive. So say, I pray thee, You're my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and that my soul shall live because of thee. (laughs) In a sense, he was, she was, she was his half-sister. The intermarriage was was still going on at this time, but what a bozo, huh? Uh, And yet, in our own hearts, what, what, what do we do sometimes? We try and save ourselves rather than take care of what's most important, our wives, our husbands. Our family. I'd rather take care of me than take care of you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Somebody's got to. (laughs) So here's Abram, and he's talking to his wife like this. Oh, and we just cry out that poor lady. But in our own hearts, what do we do? God. Abram's already done it with God. So why would we think he wouldn't do it with his wife? Mm. And that just shows that this relationship with the Lord has to be first, because if this is out of whack, then our relationships with our wives, our kids, our families are going to be out of whack too. We've got to get that relationship with the Lord right, because if we see him going away from the things of the Lord and not trusting the Lord, he's not going to trust his wife, and she's not going to trust him. And if we don't have those relationships built on trust, can you imagine if you couldn't trust God? If all of a sudden you would think as you get to heaven and he closes the door and says, Aha, I didn't really mean it. There wouldn't be a whole lot of trust there. But thank goodness we can trust our God. And we're image bearers of who he is. And we should be building that trust for others and with others that they can trust us. Mm. That they can trust what we say that they can trust what we do. But that sometimes takes sacrifice on our parts. But that's the dying to self that we need to have. And you can't do that on your own. You can only do it in a relationship with the Lord. 
as he shows you how to do it. Remember they came into Canaan. The land means subdued, humbled. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord and he'll exalt us in due time. He's the one that's going to exalt us. If we exalt ourselves, we're going to get knocked off. <laughs> so Abram comes down, tells Sarah, tell him you're my sister because you're, you're, you're just a beautiful lady and they're going to they're gonna kill me. She's almost as old as he is. And she's a beautiful lady, and he's afraid they're going to grab her and, and kill him. Wow. Yeah. You know, Miss America just went to 110 years old, you know. Just <laughs> come on here. What's going on? So say that you're my sister, that it may be well with me uh, uh, for your sake, and my soul shall live because of you. Uh, who's he trusting in right now? He's, he's trusting in himself and he's trusting in her that he's going to get delivered because she's going to be faithful. But he, she isn't even going to be with him. Ah, wrong place, wrong perception. And it came to pass that when Abram was come, come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was fair. <laughs> Very fair. Uh, amazing. Uh, you know what amazes me? <laughs> he's just come 800 miles hasn't mentioned it one single time to Sarah. Tell him you're my sister. All of a sudden he's going to Egypt, which we know is a representation of the things of the world. And he says, as we go into the world, I want you to tell him you're my sister. Nowhere else, as God was leading him when he was trusting the Lord, did he have to say that to her. It just shows our hearts that when we stop trusting God and start leaning on something else, we're going to do things that we never thought we would do because we're not, our trust is not in the right place. And look at what his lack of trust of God does. It makes him into a liar and causes his wife to lie. That's what we do to our families, to those around us, when they find out we're not really what we say that we are. It'll cause them to start lying, to start doubting even more. Mm. How important is it? for us to stay in the word and to trust God. Oh my goodness, for our families, for everything. So say, I pray that the, you're my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake and that my soul shall live because of you. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. How sad, the things of the world and this is things that we shouldn't see in the church. <laughs> but what what do they do? When you come into the church, people are looking around to see what you are. It says the princes were looking out for somebody for to be Pharaoh's wife. He's already got wives. <laughs> but he's got a whole group of people that are just looking out for more wives. Looking for somebody to grab in to incorporate in their kingdom. But in a wrong way. Remember one of the churches that we went to when we first got saved? <laughs> the second week we went to church, somebody asked me if I'd be an usher. You have no idea who I am. <laughs> I just came off the street. I just got saved. What are you talking about? You know me that well after two weeks to know? Just looking for somebody that they could incorporate into something instead of having people getting fed the Word of God and growing in grace and growing in, in the, the knowledge of who was in the church and what the church was all about. Let's grab them, let's incorporate them, let's use them so that we don't have to do any more looking all around instead of looking for what God wants for people. And that's why as you come in here, I'll never ask anybody to serve. If you've just been here for a few weeks, I'll never ask you to serve. I want you to know what we teach here. I want you to know what we're doing here. I don't want to just grab you and use you and abuse you. I want you to grow and get close to Jesus. And we should never do that. But but look at what the princes are doing. Ah, here's a candidate. Let's snag him and get him plugged into the world because then we'll have him and they'll never be able to get loose. Because then they'll, she'll be married to Pharaoh. She won't be able to go. We'll have all of Abram's riches in our land. We'll be better off. No thought of what God was supposed to do. Again, when this relationship with the Lord gets out of whack, everything gets thrown out of picture. It's like heaven when, when you were kids, and, and one of the kids had to hold the rabbit ears on the TV so that you could see the TV. <laughs> so the picture would come in. No, go a little bit more left. Okay. Oh, no, a little bit more. 
Oh, no. Go backwards one. You know, we're doing all this stuff, and we're just hanging on to that instead of just having a right picture. And the picture's wrong because this is wrong. And so he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. He, he got all kinds of presents because of what he brought instead of who he was, mm, who he was supposed to be. I can't imagine Sarai's thoughts, the betrayal, thinking of who God was, and yet this is what God is going to do to me. Mm. But her trust was certainly a lot more than that. And I'm so thankful for those the pictures that are going to come out to pass as we go through these chapters in Genesis here. And so he entreated Abraham well. He got all kinds of stuff for her, traded in his wife for stuff. <laughs> Amazing. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. <laughs> you know what's so sweet? God takes care of her. When Abraham doesn't. Wives, if you don't trust your husbands, if you don't trust the ones that you're with, you can trust the God who brought you. <laughs> Hang on to him. When when Kath and I first came to the Lord, uh, we figured out halfway quickly that I couldn't satisfy her the way that she wanted me to. And she couldn't satisfy me the way that I wanted her to. Because God is the only one that can do that. And when we can come to that point, you can really start growing in grace and start growing in the knowledge of who God is. Because you can trust him more than anybody else, more than the closest person in your life. And I love Kath. Hopefully, I would protect her. Pray for me. <laughs> but I know that even if I go... Because we, we, we talk, you know, I always volunteer myself to die first to go to heaven <laughs> you know you have those conversations you know well i'm, go I'm gonna die first because i'm a mess without you because so i gotta go first oh no i've got to go first because you can't go first you know we always do those things but you know what's sweet is that no matter which one of us goes first we know that the other one's going to be okay because god is still there he isn't going to change he's still going to be real it's going to be hard but he's still able to take care of us Sarai is in a hard place, but God's going to take care of her. And he plagues Pharaoh. It doesn't say anything about what he's doing with Abraham. I think he's just letting Abraham sit and say, Abraham, you bozo, look at what you're doing. I'll plague Israel for you, and I'll take care of your wife, which is what you're supposed to be doing. Mm. Oh, boy. The repentance time that comes afterwards. <laughs> and, and I'm so glad God forgives us when we do make bad decisions. That there's forgiveness there, and God isn't done dealing with us, and he's going to help us and, and walk with us. So Pharaoh called Abram because he knew what was going on. Isn't it amazing that Pharaoh, an unbeliever, knows what's going on more than what Abraham does? It's terrible when unbelievers tell you what God is and who God is in your life. Oh, really? He's that? <laughs> uh, I thought as a Christian you weren't supposed to do that. Oh. I hate it when people tell me that. <laughs> and they're unbelievers. Oh, God humbles us and, and shows us where we are. And what we can't do is fight spiritual things with carnal weapons, can we? He's in a battle. They're in a battle. They shouldn't have gone there. They're, they're in a battle that way. But they're, they're fighting against darkness. And darkness seems to be winning. But they can't fight spiritual battles with carnal weapons abram needs to repent and to turn back and to grab a hold of sarah and bring her where she should be and so pharaoh calls abram and says what is this that you've done unto me <laughs> i didn't do anything wrong I, I just told a little white lie folks a little white lie is a lie doesn't matter if it's white green brown orange or blue <laughs> a lie is still a lie <laughs> and it's still sin why did you not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold your wife. Take her and go your way. Get out of town, bub. <laughs> You're causing me agita. You're giving me anguish here. Get out of here. What are you doing? 
And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. You know what the best thing would have been? Well, first that he wouldn't go, right? But even if he came down, if he acted like an image bearer instead of a deceiver, hmm, he could have been there witnessing to Pharaoh. Instead, all of Egypt kicks him out of town. How sad. How sad. Talk about wasted years. <laughs> There's some wasted time right there. But God never told him to go. So when we don't, when we don't look to God and we end up doing things that we aren't supposed to be doing, we end up doing other things that are worse. We hurt our family. We hurt those that we should be witnessing to in the world around us, and they end up just kicking us out. Oh, how sad. Really, we, we need to prepare our hearts and prepare ourselves just to be in that place where, God, I want to be used by you. I want to do what's right. So help me with it, Lord. Help me not to go if you haven't told me not to go. Help me to take care of the things that you've put with me and not destroy those things. And for the Christian, it, it sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? But I have to tell myself these things so that I don't go anywhere else. And, and really, it's for all of us. That application is there. Lord, don't let me do that. Don't let me go there. Just so I can save myself, I'll hurt my family and hurt those around me. We're supposed to be in a land that's subdued. We're supposed to have hearts that are subdued to the things of the Lord. And if we do, then we aren't going to go those directions. But that's a constant, everyday communication, fellowship with our risen Lord. We just had Easter, celebrating his resurrection. We've got a risen Lord, and he's alive. You can trust him. <laughs> so let's trust him. It's simple, right? <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> it's, it's not simple, but it's doable because we've got a God that's able to do exceedingly above all that we can ask or think. We say it, we give it to other people, but we don't trust it ourselves sometimes, do we? <laughs> God, you're able. Help me to trust you. Help me to know you in this situation that I'm in right now so that I can trust you, so that I can represent you. So, Father, uh, as we get ready to take communion, Lord, as we come to that place of uh, just desiring you to take over. Lord, show us our hearts. Show us where we are. Father, if we've gone to Egypt and we, we shouldn't have gone, you haven't told us, then, Lord, uh, help us to repent and come back. Father, if we're hurting our family because of decisions we're making, Father, help us to take those back and make right decisions. But, Lord, minister to our hearts if we're going okay right now lord thank you and praise you for it because we know what you're keeping but lord prepare us for those times that are going to come to us because we know we're all going to end up in those times somewhere so help us to trust you in the midst lord and to know you well enough that we can trust you and walk with you so father help us to meditate on these things help us to seek you in the midst of these things as we ready our hearts for communion May we just ready ourselves before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for meeting us here, Lord. We're so blessed. We are the most blessed people in the world, the ones that know you, the ones that have you dwelling in our hearts. We're just so thankful, Lord, for the salvation that you've given us. We hold in our hands these tokens, Lord, that just show us the price that you paid for us, your body being broken and pierced, your blood being poured out. We remember, Lord, what you've done for us. May we allow you to take us to those depths and know it well, Lord, so that we won't go down to Egypt without you telling us, so that we won't enter into things that will cause damage to our families, that will cause the world to reject us, Instead of us being the ones that influence them, they influence us by moving us out. Oh, Lord, we need you so much every day, Lord. So thank you for dwelling with us and loving us. And Father, we take these now in remembrance of what you've done, thanking you, praising you, building an altar at this time in our lives and worshiping you because you're worthy. You're the only one that's worthy. So we take these now in praise you 
In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake.